This week, Conflict Zone is in Belgium, home to NATO, now seriously concerned by Russian military operations in Syria. My guest is General Philip Breedlove, the Alliance's top military commander. Why are the Russians running rings around him? General Breedlove, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thanks for having me. How weak do you think NATO looks to the Russians at the moment? Uh, I don't think I would use that term. Um, I think that uh, when Russia looks at the NATO nations, they see, uh, first of all, solidarity. I was able to uh, attend the Wales Summit. It was pretty impressive to sit among the 28 leaders of our nations and listen to how quickly and how stridently they came to their discussion of solidarity, collective defense, and their absolute commitment to that. It was but, pretty important. But the reason I ask that question is, they march over an international border, NATO yeah. says unacceptable, they fly their planes right. into the sovereign airspace of a NATO member, right. they give you one hour to get out of Syrian airspace. That's kicking sand in your face, isn't it? So I think that the walking over the international border, uh, a distinction uh, has to be made, of course. I do believe that Russia understands the difference of a NATO border. Uh, but clearly... Ukraine was in the Partnership for Peace. It was. NATO's it partnership still is. for Peace. Still yes. Is. yes, absolutely. Um, as to the other instances, uh, as you know, uh, the Russian ministers have come back and said that they're... they're uh, flying across the Turkish border was a navigational error. These are things that we'll have to... Which you don't accept, with. which Washington hasn't accepted. That's correct. That's what uh, I hear. So and in, in NATO as well, um, our Secretary General was pretty straightforward that that seems to be a thin argument. So where next? They fly up the Thames in London or they fly down the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Um, NATO goes around calling this unacceptable and yet there's no response. Well, I what think would you do if you were in Moscow? You'd do some more. You'd ramp it up, wouldn't you? Well, I think that That's uh, why I if ask I was whether in NATO Moscow, is weak. Yeah, I don't think NATO is weak. Um, what I see is an, a military, an alliance that is uh, standing, first of all, by its values. And part of that value is having some judgment. Of course, our uh, Turkish brothers who intercepted the aircraft in southern Turkey could have made a different choice, but they chose a voice of reason and they communicated across the radio. The uh, Russian aircraft turned and returned to Syria. So I think that this is the way we should proceed. We don't they, they want to They could have incite. made a choice to shoot it down. They could they? have, they could have. And uh, standard defense procedures would have allowed them to do that? That's correct. They have announced, and as you have seen in the past, there has been shoot downs in that area. What do you think the Russians would have done if you transgressed their border in the same way? You think they'd have just turned the other cheek and said, oh, come back and do it another day? Well, first, we would have to ask, would they have seen it? I mean, there are a lot of places where their coverage is very, very good. Um, if they had seen it, I think they would be equally as incensed as we were. They'd be a bit more than incensed. They'd have shut it down, wouldn't they? Uh, I know, I'm not sure, but clearly they would have been in, as incensed. General, the impression seems to be that the Russians are call, literally calling the shots at the moment. Um, they tell Washington and they tell the coalition that they're just putting in a few men and supplies into Syria. The next thing we know is that they are engaged in their largest military intervention in the Middle East in decades. In decades. Correct. But they just didn't happen to mention it to you. No. And you didn't happen to know about it either, which is also concerning, isn't it? We did not have all the details. That's correct. It is concerning, but it's a pattern. I mean, remember what we saw in Crimea. We're not there. We're not there. Well, yes, we were there. Remember what we still see in the Donbass, where they continue to claim that they're not there. We all know they're there. Uh, and now the same sort of pattern occurring in Syria. As I said, they gave you an hour to get out of Syrian airspace. I don't think you obliged on that occasion. That's correct. Um, but how long before the Russians start interfering with 
your combat operations. Mm -hmm. Their growing presence, their growing activity, the level of activity. How long before that happens? Well, I think it would be uh, it would be a guess. But what, as you know, at this point, we have uh, begun bilateral talks with them to try to set up well, safety procedures so that we don't come into contact with each other. But they're just saying by their actions that they don't care whether you're there or not. They'll, they'll issue the instructions, they'll issue you the orders, and you can get out of the way if you want, but otherwise they're going ahead. That doesn't sound like much in the way of consultation. No, I agree with that, but what we do see, what is actually happening on the ground, is they're staying in flight patterns that take them into areas that don't typically uh, come into conflict with where our coalition is flying. And when they do? That's, and this, this could happen quite easily. It could. That's something this, this that could This could get out of control very quickly, couldn't it? Well, that's why we're having these talks. Uh, we're initiating these safety procedures so that it doesn't. But there were get talks in September when they just said they were bringing in a few men and right. material. Right. So you can't rely on the talks, can you? Because they're not telling you, they're not telegraphing ahead what their actions are going to be, are they? Clearly. And what we need to do is try to open reasonable talks that we can depend on. So where's the red line? What do they have to do for NATO to stop saying things are unacceptable and put some markers in the, in the dust? First of all, I would never use this term, red line. Uh, that's, I don't think that's appropriate from a military individual. You leave um, that to the politicians. So what I would talk about is things which I do believe they understand. They understand what Article 5 is. They understand what collective defense is. And I think those are appropriate things to talk about. Do you think your allies understand what Article 5 is and collective defense is? Because um, I had this discussion recently with the former Polish foreign minister, Radek Sikorski. Right. And he couldn't tell me whether Article 5 was a cast iron guarantee or not. I can't speak for what he thought about. I think you should refer back to what my president said at Wales, and that is that NATO and the United States will defend its allies. He could not have been more clear. Hand on heart, mm -hmm. General, if the Russians move in to Poland or the Baltic states, is, does the U.S. go to war? Hand on heart. If the Russians moved into those states now, they would come in contact with U.S. forces that are already in those countries. Very right small now. U.S. forces. However, U.S. forces. And yes, I believe what my president said, and that is the United States and NATO. U.S. Will forces that would be overrun allies. and outnumbered very quickly. Well, if it happened uh, on a, an immediate basis, it is a small force. But remember also, Poland has a very capable military force. When it comes to Syria, mm -hmm. Russia is filling a vacuum, isn't it, that was left by the U.S. and the coalition forces, the failure of U.S. efforts to arm and train Syrian rebels. This has gone very badly. There's, there's, there's a vacuum, a clear vacuum that they came in to fill, didn't they? I think what Russia is trying to do in, uh, in Syria, I agree with what many pundits are saying. I look at it in the following framework. First and foremost, Russia wants to be seen as a mayor player, major player on the world scene. They want to be seen as an equal to those in the West. Second of all, Russia desperately wants to hang on to its ports and its airfields in Syria. Third, they need to prop up Assad because he is their guarantor of those airfields and, uh, and ports in Syria. And I do believe that the Russians clearly want the world looking at what they're doing here in Syria, see how we're cooperating, so that the world's not watching to what they're doing and continuing to do in Ukraine. Can they succeed where you failed? Uh, you know, you spent $500 million to train rebel forces. The first batch were kidnapped, killed, forced to flee. The second batch, 25% of their ammunition mm -hmm. arrived at Al-Qaeda's doorstep. It's been a catastrophe, hasn't it? So you, you're trying to grade a larger effort by these two incidences. I would never use the word that you used. Okay, well, um, let me use a word then that General Martin Dempsey, the last mm -hmm. chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, used. Right. He said the battle was stalemated. I think he's absolutely entitled to that opinion. So how and does I a, don't necessarily disagree with him at the time. But how does a group like, like ISIS or ISIL mm -hmm. stalemate 
a 28-nation military alliance led by the United States. That's quite an achievement, isn't it? Well, what it is to force is you into a stalemate. What it is is an, uh, an acceptance of the fact that we are conducting a campaign that does not invo involve the land elements of that uh, coalition. And so as we try to develop or enable land elements that are on the ground, um, you can understand the conundrum. But there was a promise on the ground. There was a promise from President Obama. He said, September 2014, we will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. Right. Since he said that, their numbers have doubled. The numbers of, of foreign fighters who've been joining them have doubled. They're now carrying out operations and aligned with other groups in at least 10 countries and areas. Mm -hmm. So they're not being degraded. Well, they're expanding, I, aren't they? I think that on the ground in the area where you discussed just a moment ago, they certainly are being degraded. Think of what their size would be without the uh, efforts of the coalition. Now, as to uh, them spreading in other places in the world, this is clearly an issue which the entire Western world and elements of the rest of the world are going to have to address because ISIL or this Daesh, this movement, uh, is definitely growing in different directions. Don't, don't, doesn't the West, the coalition, NATO, United States, all have a credibility problem now in that region? Because the words aren't backed up with deeds, are they? Well, what I would US say... U.S. demands Assad goes, he stays. U.S. threatens retaliation if Syria uses chemical weapons. There's no retaliation. This was a red line. I know you don't like the term red lines, but this was the red line which Senator John McCain said the other day must have been written in disappearing ink because it didn't mean what everybody thought it meant. So I guess I would attack this from a different way. Why do you think Russia is there? What do you think their impression of what was happening to Assad and his regime was happening? I think Russia came in because they see that Assad's regime was under great pressure and could have been failing. So the coalition and those that they are trying to help to bring about a political change in uh, Syria was accomplishing its, its objective in a lot of ways. And I think that's why you may have seen Russia rush in to try to prop up their client state. If we could go on to Ukraine, Russia in some detail. You, mm -hmm. you went to Washington in April, you spoke disturbingly Mm -hmm. about critical intelligence that you didn't have. That's correct. You told the Senate Armed Services Committee, Russian military operations in Ukraine and the region more broadly have underscored that there are critical gaps in our collection and analysis. Some Russian military exercises have caught us by surprise. Mm -hmm. Come back to the point, you have an intelligence machine. It costs mm -hmm. around, last time there were public figures, and mm -hmm. it hasn't been for a while, probably about $80 billion a year. How do you have critical gaps where Russia is concerned with the I, eyes and ears you have? I think it's actually very easy to understand. Remember that some <coughs> use two decades, some use 18 years, some use 14 years. But for 14 to 20 years, we've been trying to make a partner out of Russia. And all this time, trying to bring them into a family of values and morals that we could understand. Mistakenly, so, as it and, turned out. And so during that time, we have redirected a huge portion of our intelligence apparatus to the threats that we saw in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan. And so this machine that you talk about for the past two decades has been redirected. And now what I think you see, we see now a Russia that has decided that force is back on the table, that they will use force to change internationally recognized borders. They still occupy the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea. Their forces are still in Donbass. And they're not leaving. And so, well, let me they're finish my thought. So the bottom line is for almost two decades, we've redirected that intelligence apparatus to the other counterterrorism threats. And now we have to make decisions to bring back the focus on a Russia that is proving to not hold to those standards and morals and values that the rest of the world shares. But, but here's the worrying thing, General. If you're not even getting reliable intelligence about Russia's military exercises, mm -hmm. what possible chance do you have of getting a warning of any real attack? 
We're talking about the exercises that you didn't see coming. Right. This is a great conversation. In fact, it's a conversation that I have often now among our NATO allies, that we need to refocus our intelligence in order to develop these indications and warnings. The basis for doing... But up until last year, it wasn't refocused. You weren't seeing even the exercises taking place. Certainly, we had gaps. Eighty billion dollar machine, and you're not seeing the gaps. If you don't see them, who can? Eighty billion dollar machine, remember, that was refocused to a different part of the Unbelievable, world. Unbelievable, but it's and got a lot of arms and entrails, hasn't yeah, it? It does. And so now what we're having to do is reestablish that intel baseline that allows us to understand when we see a spike, an indication and warning, so that we can do just what you talk about. There's a general acceptance, not only that Russia has changed its views and uh, its behavior over time, but that it now represents an existential threat. A number of your colleagues have said this. Um, we had General Sir Adrian Bradshaw, Deputy Commander of mm -hmm. NATO Forces in Europe, said tensions with Russia could blow up into an all-out conflict, posing an existential threat to our whole being. You stand by that? I've said it myself. Your homework kind of left you short of that. So your intelligence capability words. has chosen quite a time to go for a walk in the park, hasn't it? Well, With this existential threat facing NATO. Clearly, for all the years that we have faced a Russia with the nuclear arsenal that it has, we've had an existential threat in, in, in Russia. And so we have kept an intelligence focus on those strategic forces. But what you were asking me about earlier were those operational and tactical forces. And that's where we took that capacity and moved it to a different place. And now, of course, we're refocusing. How long is that going to take? How right. long are you going to be blind for? I don't think while we're things blind. Are moving, while things are moving very fast. Yeah. How long are you going to be blind? That's a word you're using. <clears throat> I would never use that word either. Um, we well, are, how, how's it, how long are you, is your sight going to be inadequate? It improves every day because our intelligence community has <clears throat> begun refocusing on some of these issues. Did the West sleepwalk into a crisis over Ukraine? Should it have been avoided? Well, certainly we didn't sleepwalk into it, but I think you have the words right because I've used them myself. Some of the operational and tactical things that we saw surprised us. But what I think is remember the framework under which Crimea first started. We are again, now we all understand there was a bad bump in the system in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia. but. Uh, as we were approaching Crimea. But and you what forgave saw, them for that. That's, I wouldn't use that personal pronoun of me. No, but yeah. the, the West did. Yeah. Well, Pretended I, to get on as if it hadn't happened. I can't speak for all the nations of the West, and I can't even speak for the political leadership of NATO. But, but I notice you don't quarrel with my characterization. Clearly, uh, we as military men and women saw a military incursion into Georgia. And for a lot of reasons, which I think we saw the same thing in Ukraine, to keep them from entering uh, relationships with the West. You want to put more arms into Ukraine? Um, no. I, what I have said in the past is that we should not take this consideration off of the plate. In other words, as we approach Ukraine, we should use all our options, just like Russia is using all of its options. You know the model that military people use, diplomatic, informational, military, economic. All four bring bought, being brought to bear on Ukraine by Russia, so we should keep all four on our plate. But you, look, you, you did say that, but you also said inaction is also an action. That's and correct. And the Russians will react to that as well. That's correct. So, so what so, are we seeing now? So you're coming down on the side of putting more arms into Ukraine. I say we should not take any options off of the plate. They should all be considered. Do you think they'll listen to you if you don't? Well, Put it that way. Let's, let's look what's happened in the last few days. We've had a good Normandy format, which seems to be having some effect. And so let's give this Normandy, Normandy format, format being? The meetings between Hollande, Merkel, and Poroshenko, and, and Russia, and Putin. This format has yielded some good results in the last few days. We need to see how that works. At the same time as they're carving out possibly an exclusion zone in the eastern Mediterranean okay. and telling you and, yeah, and yeah. transgressing NATO airspace and telling you 
to get out of serious skies. No, and I you think these are good discussions. No, I love your the way you connect these because I believe the world needs to see these connections. But as it relates to Ukraine, we've seen some progress, and I think we need to allow that progress hopefully to continue. But what we really are you need to see. Clutching straws here. Jim? No, no. Here's where I'm trying to get. If Russia wants to enter the responsible world of actors in Syria, then let's see continued responsible actions in Ukraine. Remember that Minsk points to reestablishing the international border of Ukraine. Russia has moved an immense amount of equipment into Ukraine, over 1,500 pieces of armored gear, et cetera, et cetera. It will take months for Russia to get all of this gear, kit, and capability out of Ukraine. So let's see some demonstrated good action as they start to remove that from Ukraine. One of, one of the things you've been trying to do in Europe and other places is to reassure your allies. We spoke a little mm -hmm. bit about Article 5 right. earlier. Perhaps the thing that undercuts your assurances most is the recent, some of the recent war games you've been playing at the Kremlin, to, at the Pentagon rather, to simulate the Russian invasion of Estonia and Latvia. Um, since 2014, these tabletop exercises, war games, um, all ended one way, didn't they? NATO is unable to defend the Baltics. So this has been the result out of all of them, hasn't it? I will tell you the result that I saw out of all these exercises and tabletop exercises we've done is that we've, ha we've refocused our political decision makers and our senior most military decision makers of the speed and the gravity of the decisions they're going to have to make. Remember, we spent almost two de decades hugging the bear. Now we need to be able to react to a revanchous Russia that puts force back on the table. So what I've seen out of these exercises is a refocus on the decisions and the speed of decisions that we're going to have to make in order to But you to meet don't the quarrel with the, with the results. The results are that you, at, at the moment you cannot defend the Baltic There are state. lots of results. But uh, David Ochmanek, who, as mm -hmm. you know, until I last know year well. was head of force planning at right. the Pentagon, he said, we played the game 16 different times with eight different teams, always the same conclusion. NATO is unable to defend the Baltics. I know Dave, and Dave is... Uh, he does good work, and he is, uh, he is entitled to his opinions. But I think that what I pointed to before, these games point to the fact that to succeed, we have to make decisions at speed. In fact, the real game-changing decisions are made ahead of time to deter, as opposed to afterwards when we get to more kinetic operations. But if you, if you can't defend the Baltics, What's the point of having a spearhead force of 5,000 people, which the, the Europeans are pretty reluctant to set up anyway, aren't they? You said those words. I did not You're say You're not quarreling can, with them. I, cannot, I will not say that we cannot do what you said. We, we, uh, this is our central theme here at Allied Command Operations, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, is defending all of our allies, not just the Baltics even if on paper and in the tabletop exercises you can't at the moment do that. Given the right decisions at speed, we can do it. General, you were in Afghanistan last month, almost yes. a year mm -hmm. since NATO ended its mm -hmm. combat I'm there operations often. there. It was the end of the bloodiest year of the entire war and it's yes. still going. And the first and year that Afghanistan badly. was on its own, literally. Yeah, and the first year since 2001 now that mm -hmm. um, the Taliban have actually seized a city, Kunduz, mm -hmm. in the north. The departure plans should be revised then, shouldn't they? Well, you can't leave them in the middle of the, the worst period of conflict in 13 years, can you? I think uh, many of our military leadership, and you've heard General Campbell, our, our uh, resolute support, and our American commander in Afghanistan recommend that we should have a different departure schedule, that we should consider uh, um, that the changes in troop levels and capabilities should be condition-based. Uh, I know that he has uh, delivered his recommendations to the command chain, uh, as have uh, General Austin and I and our separate command chains, and uh, we'll see where the That's decision makers yes. go. Change, change, the change the schedule. We should allow our commanders to see those recommendations before we share them publicly. But yes, we are talking about conditions-based change 
to our force and capability levels. Would you also support uh, an international uh, investigation into the attack on the hospital? Absolutely. In Kunduz? Absolutely. In fact, that, I that think... That led to the death of 22 people, staff and patients. Yep. I think that there are three now ongoing that I know of. But an international, independent investigation. I think... Isn't it very important because the story's changed? I think that our, our Secretary of Defense has been very, very clear on this, that we support getting to the problem, what happened, how it happened, and have a full, open, and transparent investigation, and so we support the three Using that are a fact-finding body that was set up under the Geneva Conventions, which is now what Médecins Sans Frontières are talking about. I, I think this is their absolute right to ask for this investigation. And you'd support that? We will support it if we, you we're going to support it. Absolutely. General Breedlove, thanks very much for being on Conflict Zone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.